we are going to bring on our panel for this afternoon. And um, Alicia, thank you for your really thoughtful summary of this morning's uh, con very rich conversation. It was rich. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was terrific. Um, as, I, as I know this afternoon will be as well. So, um, we, you know, waste no time in bringing on our panel, uh, beginning with uh, Darren Atwater. Welcome, Darren. Nice to have you with us. Good to be with you. Camille Delaney McNeil. Hi, Camille. Hi. Thanks for being with us today. Carl DuPont. Hello, everyone. Hi, Carl. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Fredera Hadley. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here with you all. Hi, Fredera. Thanks for being here. And Richard White. Richard. I think you're muted. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you. Great to have you here, Richard. So um, we'll, we'll, I'm going to ask you all the same question that we asked, the uh, first question we asked the panel this morning, uh, w uh, which is to say, how would you, and it's a, it's a large, you know, broad question, I would say, but how would you, each of you characterize um, the state of uh, anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in the performing arts world today? And specifically, you know, some of you may want to address um, in schools that are training artists. Although you don't have to limit yourself to that, but that's, you know, somewhat of our focus. So, I, you know, I want to make sure that we include that as well. But if you do each take, you know, two to three minutes and give us your view of that, and maybe at the top of your comments, if you could also just identify your affiliation also, because that's available to folks in the bios and everything, but that way, you know, they'll, they'll meet you right away here and, and make the connection. Um, and we'll go around the, we'll go around the horn. You want to start, Darren? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've just been thinking about this in terms of my, my work. Um, with Soulful Symphony, but I think we're in another age of discovery. Um, I actually posted about this recently. And um, it's a lot of repurposing of work that has been at the forefront of our culture, though hidden from many, and specifically in terms of our programming. And a lot of times I, you know, I've kind of termed this um, as being optically black or black optics a lot of times where it's, kind of been suppressed and denied in the historical process of a lot of institutions. And now it's kind of like being repurposed and being rediscovered or discovered for the first time. So I think we're in an age of discovery in that we're kind of seeing um, the need for diversity, inclusion and equity as something that is um, kind of a hot topic and a buzz topic instead of being something that it's should be ongoing in terms of the historical process of, of um, arts, arts and culture. And I also think that we, we oftentimes see this through the lens of racial progress um, and not always racial policies, which are two different things. And so if we're judging performing arts and inclusion through racial progress, we can say, okay, um, like during the 60s, there were a lot of black freedom movements who challenged institutional responsibilities and through egalitarian hiring practice, practices. So we see a lot of equality there, but in terms of construct structural changes that happen a lot through race, through policy change, um, a lot of times that can get veiled in the lens of seeing racial progress, which is not always equal to, to policies that um, change the structural and dismantle things that have limited us from having kind of the diversity um, programmatically and um, in terms of inviting people of color into spaces that they haven't often occupied. Um, but it's it's great to see, but I always say that we've been doing this. Um, there's been a large history of this collision of African and European cultures that has really created a, a model and a canon of music that is really unrivaled. Um, and it's a cultural achievement, 400 year cultural achievement um, of the first order. Um, so to recognize that, to celebrate that, to highlight that, and not just as some um, diversity spotlight, but really being ensconced and nested in the domain of the performing arts where our performance and our performing arts and the stages and the repertoires um, kind of mirror and shadow that. Otherwise we find ourselves oftentimes having programs and opportunities that don't really look like um, 
some of the things that we're aspiring to programmatically and composers. And it's enlarging the social base. I always say that the social base of classical music and the performing arts um, is really not as thorough and as expanded as we often think it is. So it's extremely low when you think of composers, performers, and listeners, that social base needs to be brought to it to be more inclusive. And I think that speaks to something I'm sure I'll get to later is making sure that we're really tethered to vernacular music and popular music and building this bridge from high art to popular culture, uh, which is also constructionism because you know all of our high art at one time came from folk music and, and popular culture. So um, you know, as much as the diversity we're talking about in terms of spaces and places and faces, it's important to think of the diversity of the types of musics and the types of um, programming that are kind of like ferreted out of this treasure trove of American and African-American culture. Thanks, Darren. And it's, it's great to have you here, particularly as an early adopter of all of this. Yeah. Sure. Um, Camille, we'll, we'll go to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fred, and and completely agree with Darren. And I think you're go you're going to hear a lot of similar threads from all of us <laughs> this afternoon because it, it's true. I mean, um, there's there's a lot of activity happening. And and one thing that I wrote down in thinking about responding to this question in in terms of the state of where we are, it's very active, but it's still very reactionary. Mm -hmm. um, and so when Darren speaks about, uh, you know, the work that's that's come before and, and things that have been seen, perhaps unseen or deliberately unseen, does not take away the fact that now that people are kind of awoken, right, to what's happening in the world, what's happening in our cultural institutions, what's happening with artists and, and representation on the stage is, is very different, is very different. And I, I kind of see this this clamoring to, oh, well, now we, we now we know who Florence Price is. So we're programming her on, on every concert. You know, okay, that's wonderful. But also there's the, the component that really rises up for me. And this is the work that I'm in, right? I, I'm, I'm working with the LA Phil. I'm with the education program, the Yolo program in Baltimore. I was with the um, Orchids program with the Baltimore Symphony. And so there's something there in talking about um, uh, symphonic uh, predominantly white cultural institutions doing community work. We'll get to that at another time. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is there's a component um, in regards to education and what's happening there. I must say, uh, being a, a graduate and an alumna of Peabody Institute myself, um, you know, we, we weren't programming price. We weren't programming still. We weren't doing these things actively in the educational experience of what we were um, you know, asked to do in becoming artists, right? And we're going out into our communities, we're asked to do these community outreach concerts, we're asked to um, perform for the public, we're asked to engage people and we're missing parts of our history, right? We're missing parts of our, our, our repertoire and our knowledge. So I think there's, there's still a gap there as well. And there's an impetus from my perspective, a real urgency and embedding that into the fabric of what we teach, what we're teaching our young people, um, all the way through our higher education institutions, all the way to primary, elementary school, kindergarten, whatever the case may be, this representation is abundant and it's clear and it's pervasive because that's the reality and that's history and that's real. And so I'm while I'm seeing this beautiful energy, this wonderful programming, these the celebration of Black, Brown artists, Indigenous works, all you know, all of this um, energy, <laughs> there's no better word for it. We're still kind of lacking um, in that area of education and pipeline, and and there are again, there is work being done by individuals and folks who have made this uh, their their focus of what they do. But they're, you know, it's it's kind of disjointed still. It's disjointed. And when we're talking about large institutions, cultural institutions trying to do this work, are you really prepared to do what it takes to, you know, we we heard the word dismantle. Um, Alexander spoke about this in his social justice, you know, programming and things like that. Are we really ready to dismantle what it's going to take to be as inclusive, to really push this forward? This is still a question, you know. Um, 400 years of history, but still, I mean, after 
uh, the, the awakening around George Floyd and, and everyone seemed to be kind of aware of what's going on. Now we're two years later, going on to three years later, what really has moved forward, right? Um, and so these are, these are things that come up for me. And as I'm trying to assess the state of what my responsibility is, as a woman of color, as a musician, as an artist, as a teacher, as an educator, it is a heavy burden to carry, but one that is so, so important. And we need to think about that too, about who are in these spaces, in these institutions, in these um, uh, arenas, are they by themselves? Are we really changing our mindsets and our thinking? Um, there's still some work to be done here from my perspective. Thank you uh, for that, Camille. Really, very thoughtful. Um, Carl. I'm so glad you called on me next because I was afraid there would be nothing left to say <laughs> after these amazing colleagues and that <laughs> and that amazing introduction, Alicia. So I um, I wholeheartedly concur with uh, what my colleagues are saying. And to that, I would also like to offer perhaps a way of reframing or reconceptualizing that idea, because I'm, I'm hearing the word pipeline come up often, and I'm hearing the idea of 400 years, and those are so relevant to what's going on today. Um, I would like to also expand the idea to think about an ecosystem rather than a pipeline, or I should say in addition to a pipeline. Um, and instead of 400 years, I would like to think of 200,000 years, because we understand after dissecting the genome that African originated people are the originated people. And so therefore all culture and all migration did come from there. And so all musics did sprout up from there. And so when we look at only specific types of music, when we call our organizations music organizations, but we only look at this tiny sliver historically and contemporarily of what music is, we are actually doing a disservice to the word and we're doing a disservice to what we can do because we are so infinite in what we can access and what we can recreate. And um, I like to think of, in answer to your question, Fred, where are we as arts organizations? To me, and I'm a, I'm a voice teacher. Oh, I, my organization is I am a voice teacher at Peabody Conservatory. So it kind of seems that we are in that sophomore year where we keep having those aha moments, lesson after lesson, and it's really exciting. Um, but the next week we have to do it over again. And we're seeing that constantly happening with our arts organizations, these brilliant ideas, these breakthroughs, but the follow through is what is, is what we're hoping for, is what we're working for. And so I think that there's so much progress that's being made and so many great ideas that are happening. And now we have the hard work to do, which is to return to the practice room and figure out how to do it on our own every single day at every iteration. So I'll, I'll stop there because I'm prone to preach. Thanks, Carl. Uh, for Dara. I agree, you know, I was feverishly jotting down notes because y'all were dropping so many um, brilliant nuggets. <laughs> so snapping fingers for everything that's been said because I agree. Um, my affiliations are that I'm an ethnomusicology professor at the Juilliard School and Music History Department. And I'm also program lead at the Denise Grace Foundation for an initiative called Shared Voices, which deals with some of those questions of ecosystems that Carl just raised. Um, and the long history between um, his, uh, historically Black colleges and universities and um, conservatories. We have a long history of Black conservatory graduates going and founding music programs at HBCUs, and then lots of HBCU graduates who have gone on to do graduate study and continuing education at conservatories. And so um, that is a whole story in and of itself. To the question at hand, um, I will be honest and say that I'm both curious to see how this is all going to sort itself out, because as other panelists have said, there is a real fervor at the moment um, but this has happened before. 
right, um, in American history, where it, and as uh, I think Camille was saying, in a largely reactionary way. And so part of me thinks it's too early to tell what does all of this look like five years from now, 10 years from now? Does the does our musical world look fundamentally different from um, is this a blip or is this a line of demarcation? These are the questions that I often ask going back to Darren's point about racial progress versus policy. Are there substantive changes in the uh, the classical music ecosystem, arts world ecosystem that reframes whose voices get to be heard? And I think that um, Dr. Blake made a really important comment about how we even think about events. And this appeals to me as an ethnomusicologist who is concerned with musical meaning and how we construct musical meaning. Um, every aspect of how we imagine the concert experience is a facet that can be rethought and reimagined. Everything from what a concert season looks like, how we build these things, who we imagine the audience is for this music, where these concerts are staged. Is there a talk back? What are the events that surround the, um, the performance itself? Who is performing? What is performed? All of these things, each vector mentioned is grounds for re uh, renovation and reconsideration. And I think that's really important because part of what is really important to me in this moment is this idea of equitable collaboration. Um, I remember having a conversation with Dr. David Morrow, who's the director of the Morehouse Glee Club, and he was saying that their repertoire has always been diverse. They've always done spirituals, cantatas, madrigals, all these things. This is a recurring theme that I've heard from um, choral conductors at HBCUs. And so it's not that this idea of diverse repertoire is new. It isn't. It's new at predominantly white institutions, but Black institutions um, have long had to be able to d demonstrate this mastery across um, genre. And I think it's really important in this moment and this goes back to understanding and learning history and where these knowledges already exist with people like Darren Atwater and the Soulful Symphony, people who have been doing this for a really long time, finding ways to not take over what they are doing and have built, but finding equitable ways to partner, listen, learn, follow from people who have had to think about these things day in and day out, not as a matter of convenience, but one of survival. Right. And I will say it. Um, I have students and my and what makes me hopeful is that I see among my students a real genuine curiosity and wanting to know and sometimes indignation because they don't already know. Right. They want to. Uh, and, 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 and so I go to students recitals and I'll hear a Jesse Montgomery piece, um, um, you know, played by a string quartet. And they want to know not just these names, but they want to know the stories that these composers are giving voice to. They want to know about the, how do you research that? How do you even think about that? And I remember just as a closing anecdote, I had a student who was adding a few pieces by Undine Smith Moore to a performance that she was doing. And she was just like, I can't, I can't find much online about her, even teaching students how to research Black composers, because what we know is if their music wasn't published, very often their stories, their, their journeys weren't preserved in ways that students read as readily accessible. And I was able to direct her back to folks at Virginia State University, where Undine Smith Moore taught, and her papers, which are housed at Indiana University in the Archives of African Music and Culture. So even like helping students and developing tools so that people can be more informed and delve deeper so that hopefully all of this becomes um, a part of the air that we breathe in the arts and not um, a timely add-on to cover our bases or something for Black History Month or Women's History Month or whatever the case may be, but is a part of the fabric of how we imagine the arts to exist to serve the maximum good and the maximum number of people. Thank you, Fredero. Richard. Well, the good news is I'm used to going last because of my last name. So uh, bravo to the entire committee. I personally think we're doing a good job of checking the box, but more organizations need reoccurring concert series like what Darren Atwater is doing with his Soul for Symphony in Baltimore. 
And just on a side note, Darren, one day you got to program something with Tuba so I can join you. Dante tells me about it all the time. Uh, I won't get off course too far, but I think what you're doing is the kind of long-term buy-in that we need from organizations. Two words that come to my mind when we talk about this is collaboration and interdisciplinary. I think we have to be sure that we're not creating the same things we're fighting, which is segregation, isolation, and exclusion. I think what we want to be mindful of is that we're not just having an isolated example of representation, but what we really need is a culture, and that culture is our entire heritage and not just selected favoritism of various things. I think we have to stop being so divisive. You know, division is an interesting word. Uh, I just looked at the word because it's like we are really divided. And I think we need to start extracting the best part of that word, which is vision and having the same goal, expectations, and projected outcomes. Because most of our problem is that we don't we don't agree on those three things. I heard the initial speaker say, what are our goals? Okay, what are our expectations and what are our projected outcomes? If we're not on the same page with those things, we're going to have some serious trouble. And we have to put music in the sense where it's a necessity, not a luxury, that it's the fabric. I heard someone say fabric. I love that word. It's the fabric of our community. So we are essential because we are part of healing, you know, and there's something that people are hesitant to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it because I think the we need to be honest. And sometimes I think the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. I am not a fan of well-intended tokenism. I think everything that we do, excellence has to be at the forefront of it. And we have a tremendous responsibility to be honest about where the bar of excellence is. And under no circumstances should we ever lower it. What that gives everybody is the opportunity to have what I call the three C's. And that's a chance to create the, the kind of choices or to have the the, the chance to create the kind of choices that leads to the change that's for the betterment of all. Because we just want a chance, you know, and we want to be able to choose from the choices that before us to see the kind of change that we desire to see. I think that's very important moving forward. And I think we also have to keep one word in mind, and that's together. And when I think of together, it means to get her. That's what the word literally breaks down to. And that's Lady Liberty in a broader sense outside of music. And to get her is chance, choice, and change. We all need that chance to, to create, make the right choices to see the kind of change that we want to see. I, too, can be long-winded and preach like Carl, so I think I'm going to put a button on this because I'm taking notes here. I think the information here is extraordinary, and if we could all be sponges, I think we're essentially offering the world our very best here today, and collectively, that has to equal something magnificent. So I'm signing up for the collective power of us and our brain power because I think moving forward, that's how we're going to get the desired results collectively. Thank you. That's really, really great way to sum that up, that question up, Richard. Very well said. Um, Alicia, you have a question for this? I do, question. absolutely, absolutely. And and um, I, I'm, I, I, in my mind, I'm brewing. I'm thinking about uh, as we stand in this moment, um, I hear a lot of um, excitement about what may come next. But I think there's also, I think we have to call out, there's also some fear right? Um, we know what's happened historically in our country when civil rights movements have advanced. We look at uh, uh, Reconstruction. We can look at the Tulsa bombings and massacre, right? As examples of what happens when um, Black people in this country have made steps forward um, and been met with violence, yes? Um, and I think that there is that sense in the present moment. We've seen, we saw the resurrection, uh, the insurrection, or whatever they're calling it, last last January, as that attempt um, to to move things forward. And I see something. I saw something in the chat about demographics. But we, as Black people, know, and all Americans should know, that just because you have a physical majority does not mean you have political power and access. Power doesn't doesn't work that way. Um, when we look at the demographics of the South during the enslavement of, you know, hundreds of thousands of Africans, we know that in places, Black people were the majority, physical majority, 
um, but they did not have access to power. So this is an opportunity just for us to reimagine how we can move forward from a humanistic place where we see the value in each other. We understand the impact of the legacy that we've all contributed to the American dream and ideals. And we move together as a country. And I do feel strongly, as all of you, that we as creators and creative thinkers have such a role to play in reimagining the new world. So I'm excited for us to have this conversation. Now, speaking of that, we'd like to hear of what's happening now. What are you seeing in the field? What are you seeing in the institutions where you are that's inspiring you? Or what are you doing um, that you can share with? Uh, we have a very hungry crowd that's assembled that wants to hear some strategies, some applications to how folks are advancing racial equity in the institutions where they are or in the work that they're doing. And we'd love to hear some examples of work. So I'm looking to see who's leaning forward. That I'm looking for that lean in to see who would like to kick us off um, so we can hear about some of the work that you're doing. All right, Richard. Uh, first, you mentioned uh, a word that I think we have to unpack a little bit. You mentioned fear. And I think I saw an acronym. I can't take credit for it. And I, I don't think it was an author subscribed to it. But fear has two meanings. Uh, face everything and run or face everything and rise. I think the second is what we want to do. And I think uh, we're we're charged with that. In my own personal work, I wrote a book called I'm Possible with the word impossible dissected. And what I'm doing, speaking of Tulsa, Oklahoma, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma right now. I just spoke to the symphony and viewed uh, tremendous. They have a museum here, much like the Civil Rights Museum. Put it on your bucket list. It is very informational and a must, a must see for us. Uh, I'm trying to show people that the impossible is possible. I want everyone to read my book and feel like a superhero. Why is that? Because a superhero has something that they are invincible to. I think too often in our country, we use the, 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 the verbiage of because of. Because of lack of space, we can't do this. Because of funding, we can't do that. Because of resources, we can't do that. I'm encouraging everyone to start thinking instead, in spite of, in spite of the lack of resources, in spite of the lack of money, in spite of the lack of space, I will show you that I can do it because I can. And I will show you right now that I can do it because procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God or the universe owes you more time to do what you had time to do. The time is now for us to move forward. Aim high, breaking records, and doing it now. I'm setting the stage and just using my life as an example. Things aren't going to be easy. Life is fair is to everyone because it's unfair to everyone. Once we get over that, we know that we're going to be sucker punched. We ain't going to see it coming. So let's brace ourselves for that and, and know that it's coming. I think we all have a story to tell. And I think it's the best thing we could do, travel the world and our institutions. By the way, I didn't say so. I'm going to get in trouble. I represent University of New Mexico. That's my school. Sorry. I think we all need to travel the world and infuse in our own environments our stories. I really want to keep saying this today. Tradition in addition to. We got here some kind of way. I recognize that Mozart, Beethoven. Hey, guess what? They've been choosing from the same 12 notes as Richard White. And when we mount the stage, there's not a selective set of notes for the black tube as Richard White. Guess what? I got news for everybody. We choose from the same set of notes. So everyone needs to tell their story because their story is valuable. And collectively, our stories will paint the portrait that we need to see and the kind of portrait that people will stop, look, and listen to. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I, I, I appreciate you sharing about your experience and, and, um, and it's very interesting. I'm, I'm definitely going to pick up your book so I can understand more <laughs> uh, and dig in more. Thank you so much. And Carl, will you, uh, will you share with us about your work? Yes, because um, my work kind of dovetails into what Richard was talking about, which is everybody has a story and we need to share those stories. Um, I am the co-artistic lead of the Kennedy Center's Washington National Opera, Opera Institute, as you know, Alicia, this summer, because we're, we're bringing you in, um, because opera isn't just about singing the notes. We also have to talk about the actual fabric of how it was created and the stories that we bring ourselves. And so one of the things that we are featuring 
in this opera institute is not the composers as someone or something that is abstract, but as the people who come in, these young singers are also gonna be tasked with improvising, with writing librettos, with putting their experience into song so they can understand how my humanity relates to my voice, relates to my audience and my colleagues. And then we're gonna have them do some kind of um, comedy improv where they're up as actors relating to themselves in space time and just moving about, like just understanding how my body works on stage. And then we're going to use art song by a diverse range of composers and um, gender expressions and racial identities in order for them to see a little bit more about storytelling from a different perspective. So when all of that is laid as the groundwork, then we can approach opera with a clear eyed kind of expectation and we can see where we've been excluded. We don't just take that for granted. We wanna say its name. We wanna show where things have been kind of written out. We wanna acknowledge when Despina talks about the chocolate that she's brewing for Fior de Ligia and Dorabella, we wanna acknowledge where that sugar came from and how the black body was incorporated in that and how the parchment that Mozart was writing on was not from his backyard in Vienna. We have to talk about those things and see how we are implicated in every atom, quite literally, of this operatic enterprise. And so I'm really excited to do that. And as part of this, as part of this ecosystem for these students that are 16 to 18, so that, as you mentioned, these future leaders of arts have an understanding at the ground level. I see that as so revolutionary. I, I thank you for sharing the, 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 the nuts and bolts of it, but it sounds like it's undergirded by a deep um, desire to revolutionize the way we think about whose story gets told, the value that folks show up with. And also there's some sense I'm feeling around validating the lived experience of every one of your students. Often we, when we think about music, we do think about, oh, this musical training you're getting is the first you're getting. Now you're learning about music. Well, that's something we commonly hear. Um, oh, now you, this is your first time engaging with Beethoven. Oh, you're beginning to learn about music. And it sounds like you're validating the years of lullabies and block parties and Sunday morning cleanups and community music making that people show up with full, right? This yes. very <laughs> model of thinking. Well, as you all know, anthropologists have discovered that all cultures at all times have been musical. <sighs> and so for us to start at Leonid and Periton, my God, I don't understand it. But that was what I paid for and that was what I got is my education. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we do need that revolution. That's incredible. Let's hear from some other folks. Camille, Can I? Oh. oh. Fredera, please, please. And then we'll jump with Camille. I'll be really brief, but Carl, the way you laid it out kind of teed me up to talk about this. I teach both courses on African-American music and world music courses um, at Juilliard. And one of the things that's really interesting um, is even this conversation about the plurality of classical musics, right? Even the idea that there is more than one classical music in the world, we can talk about Carnatic music of India. We can talk about gamelan music of Indonesia. Both of these are thousands of years old art music traditions that exist in different parts of the world. And so just even having that point, when we, we use classical music in the singular as if there is only one and each one has its own sort of presentation mode, scalular designs, approaches to rhythm, that are anchored in those specific cultures. So, you know, even just um, reimagining how we use, in a conservatory, use classical music, that term a million times a day. So even interrogating how we use a term like that and who that pushes out, and those musics have directly informed Western classical music. WC Pagodes is modeled and inspired by Gamelan traditions. And, and so even how we talk about the music history that we do teach in a more um, um, comprehensive way that elevates the cultures and the peoples of the world beyond 
um, anecdotes or muses or inspirations, but a vital part of even the canon that we do have in the West, I think is a really striking way to, um, I've found in my courses to delve into these histories and to push our thinking about why it's important to think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and these things now is because the presence of the quote unquote other, as, as, as anthropologists talked about the colored peoples of the world, um, has always been there. That actually isn't new. So when, when we um, acknowledge and center that history in a more uh, global and grounded way, then I think it gives us even greater gravitas um, and precedence for the work that we're doing now. Thank you, Federa. And Camille. Uh, so, so many threads. This is brilliant. Um, and, you know, Carl, I want to, Federa, absolutely, and then Carl, I want to kind of speak to the whole opera. I mean, growing up with objectively a celebrated Black African American opera singer who was quite revered in, in the world. Um, storytelling <laughs> has been the arc of my entire artistic experience. And, you know, Alicia, you brought up something much earlier that I wanted to circle back to around this conversation of what it's going to take, right, to really kind of move this forward. And I just wanted to speak to the piece about identity, because what we're trying to do in the world with trying to awaken people even more to the necessity of this is challenging their identity and everything they have formed themselves around, right? And we <laughs> have had to do that already. We've had to be masters. I love that, um, uh, you know, being masters of all traditions, of all genres, we've had to have that fluidity. So why are we still othered? Right. And why are others not held and elevated to our standard of what we have to do? So I think there's a component of understanding that when we are challenging people's identity, this is to speak about insurrection. Right. OK, this is why these things happen. And so there's a psychology piece we have to speak to about really helping to educate people at a deeper level in ways that I think sometimes we don't always want to take the time to do. But if we're talking about all the collective points of what we need to do, that is going to be critical. And I think something that I'm excited about um, in, in the work that I'm doing now, well, there, there are several things, but one, one area is around curriculum, right? We're speaking to this about what our young people are learning, what is responsive to their community, to their culture, and building that into a framework. And we're doing that. We're starting that process where we are right now um, and incorporating what, what would it look like to incorporate um, ethnic studies into the actual music curriculum of what we're doing. And by the way, not labeling it ethnic studies, just labeling it curriculum, because this is what it needs to be. It's not some specialized opportunity over here. This is just our curriculum. It's something that is reflective of our students and their experiences, their shared experiences, their community experiences, the lives that they live, the art that they appreciate, and the art that they create. And so this is a huge process, but something I'm really, really, really excited by. And, and having the center um, that I am governing in Inglewood. I mean, that is a big step in the right direction in terms of building roots. And what my responsibility is, is to make sure it is authentically inclusive of the culture, the vibrancy, and the art that already, already was existent there. And I think people kind of see these, um, you know, fixtures going up and, and buildings and, and fancy facades and think, this is not for me. And it couldn't be quite the opposite. And so in terms of programming, we've been able to do some really interesting things, inviting artists from the community to present in our space and venue to our young people and, and to others. We're hosting a, a beautiful festival in about a month uh, that has like not a lick of classical music on it, <laughs> Western classical music. Thank you for there. Um, and it's going to be fabulous. And, and the community is, is super excited about it and engaged. So these are some of the things that, you know, if, if somebody kind of isolates the LA Phil or, or institutions like that and says, well, you know, what are you doing to push this forward? These are the micro changes that are starting to happen um, and that I'm really excited about it. But we really got to speak to that identity piece because without that, we're, we're not going to move forward. We're going to keep that cycle. 
That's incredible to think about that identity piece, the social, the psychological piece. Um, Darren, before we shift to the next question, did you want to talk a little bit about the popular culture work that you're doing to bridge those gaps there? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, in, in 1995, I had a debut with the uh, National Symphony Orchestra. I um, composed a con piano concerto called uh, Maschio. And the theme was a spiritual, I want Jesus to walk with me. And um, that was kind of my way back to, uh, for Darren's point of HBCUs, I went to Morgan State. So we did everything from Beethoven to Stevie Wonder, right? It was a buffet of, of musical culture. So that was kind of the seed that kind of sprung. It was like, oh, wow, this is my heritage, but also, you know, classical music and the classical arts have a way of kind of insulating and also almost calcifying the type of um, the energy behind the music that comes from specifically our tradition out of ritual and out of functionality and out of utilitarianism, right? So it's like, how do we begin to, for me as a composer, it was like, how do I begin to express the, the energy of the music that comes from me out of ritual? And it's almost a return. Like, I think someone said that we have to stop thinking of music as this siloed 400 year history of, of African-Americans in America. But if you think back and go back to even um, Iliad and Odyssey, you know, that was, they were thought of as improvisational. It was not written down. It was a music that was oral you know, early passed down and it kind of got fixated at a time. We think about the symphony orchestra, not only the orchestra as a body of instruments and as an anatomy, but even as we have kind of formed our performance spaces and forget that the orchestra was actually the place where people came to experience ritual. And it wasn't until the invention of the spectator where the participants and the spectators became divided that we have this whole idea of somebody producing something for you to consume. And so back to, and just out of ritual that comes out of, for me, I grew up in the church and playing jazz. So it was like, how do we begin to take this music and kind of like, kind of like in, nested inside of classical music. So I started that in terms of as a composer, but then I started an organization that kind of spoke to the state of mind in terms of how we experience music. So Soulful Symphony was not just a collection of African-American musicians often to, you know, to play classical music or to, to romanticize the idea of black musicians being on stage playing classical music. It was more a state of mind in terms of how we experience ritual through music. And so my approach has always been um, how popular music and how folk music is introduced into frameworks that not oftentimes we see. Because the interesting thing is a lot of times you're validated or affirmed even as a composer by your ability to have musical works that are avant-garde or or have this type of Western sophistication. So anytime you start to bring up the word pop music or jazz or gospel in terms of the framework of the classical music, it, it kind of seems like it's like, oh, okay, they, well, they're doing covers or it doesn't have the same type of ascendancy a lot of times that, um, we think the Western canon has. So, I mean, it's that's been my work in terms of a composer, in terms of experiences, is really getting back to how we begin to re-ritualize the experience of um, concerts. I mean, it goes back to Dvorak, who came here in 1895, we all know, and said, how come you're not looking to your soil for your national identity? You know, and he said, he wrote the New World Symphony kind of as an example. And here we are like 100 plus years later, still grappling with you know, does jazz have the ascending quality to become, you know, a real valid form of music? And now does hip hop. Um, I've recently done work, I'm doing work from DJ D Nice. And we're doing this whole idea of, you know, a mashup of DJ and symphony orchestra. And I say it's no different than experiencing Duke Ellington and Basie and Fletcher Henderson and big bands in the 20s and 30s. Like you can only experience the big band as a function of dance music in the Savoy Ballroom. It was not something that you went to listen to. Like me and Wenton talk about it all the time. He said, I go across the world and people sit down and listen to, listen to jazz and big band music. And it's a functional music, you're supposed to be dancing, right? So it's the idea of how do we reappropriate ritual and functionality in our music. And it's changed my, my sense of what's possible again. 
because to be honest, I was kind of worn out from the whole idea of penetrating this idea of what you know African American music is in terms of classical arts. So I've been kind of recatalyzed by this whole idea of how we bring back the functionality of experience. I think that's a, a missing aspect of even how we teach and educate the next generation. They say, oh, okay, this music has some, some utility to it outside of the academy, outside of the performance space. And a lot of times they are amputating what they're seeing in terms of the academy and what the experiences are. I hear a lot of teachers say, oh, they play this when they're you know, on TikTok and then when they come to their lessons, they feel like those two worlds never meet. Um, but that's also, we have to demystify that. I mean, all of, you know, Bach, those dance suites, you know, all Spanish dance music, right? And it's getting back to that. Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, da -ba 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 -ba, Little Birch Tree, that's all Russian peasant music. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Russian um, pagan music. So all this music springs up from the soil and how we begin to appropriate that and see the ascendance inside of that is really necessary, not only now, but how we translate that to people who are conceiving and imagining um, ways to tell the stories through the framework of um, music. So um, I, I'm trying to think about how to formulate this question and listening to this whole conversation. And I, I, I'll start from the a comment I made this morning and in, um, in the opening comments that I made, brief opening comments. When I was talking about how I, I think this whole issue for us in our field, when I think of the class, the classical arts is an existential question. And the reason I use the term existential is because when you look at trends in audiences, I come from the, I came from the orchestra world where I spent 20 years and you look at where demographic trends are going in this country and you put those two pieces together, you come away with the inevitable conclusion that if, if we don't change the way we think about this, we won't have an audience at all. We already have a diminishing audience. And as that demographic changes, that audience will diminish even more unless that audience changes. And in order to do that, you have to change the people who are involved in this. So it, in some sense, it comes back to the question of access, right? Early access, particularly in a, in, a, in, a, in a field where early access, at least as we define, you know, as, as conservatories, for example, have historically defined training for this kind of, you know, career. Uh, it becomes a question of early access. But is that even the right way to think about it? I mean, we have a program that addresses early access now and, and a number of schools do, and it's, it's quite successful. But I wonder if, you know, if the bigger question is, are we, are we thinking about what, what qualifies for access in the wrong way? I, you know, I'm thinking back to Richard's comment about excellence, you can't give up excellence, but is there something wrong with the way we define, when I say we, I mean, standard conservatories, for example, define excellence. And, you know, so, so I'm, you know, one of the things as, as I'm sitting here listening to this, do we need to broaden how we think about that in order to engage more people in this field and not just take the tact of, if we train more people, you know, from the beginning in the way we train people, that it will all be better. And maybe it's both, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what, what y'all think about that. Can I jump in real quick and no, I'll, sure. I'll get off? I mean, I think we have to redefine value and what we are adjudicating as excellence, right? If it's this whole idea of, his, of historicism. So in, I think it was 1743, and it was the whole idea of the concert of ancient music. And then Mendelssohn rediscovered, you know, um, St. Matthew Bach, right? So, so that led us on a path specifically in classical music of historicism, meaning that we began to take civic pride in the music that comes from a certain you know, whether it's Mannheim or whether it's Vienna. And it gets away from before historicism, you had commissions and you had music coming from the church. Bach was writing cantatas all the time. And it was this whole idea of the tradition being catalyzed by new works and new music. So the training to me, it's like a volcano that erupts and then it becomes calcified and it doesn't create new, new land masses. Like it has to continue to erupt into new ways of validating and energizing music that is really happening now. Like what is the experience of music and what are those stories that are telling now and how can we frame those around, um, I believe it was um, Alain Locke who said, mastery of form and tradition, no, mastery of form and technique and mastery of mood and spirit. So how can we marry those two things in terms of 
the tradition of excellence that comes with this great canon of music that we have, the gravity of classical music, technically, formally, but also mood and spirit, which is native. It's, it's functional, it's happening. It's being engaged with who we are as Americans right now. I say, if we came to America and still played cricket and golf and not invented baseball and football and basketball, it's how we begin to always redefining who we are and what those stories are and what we're validating and affirming as a music that is rises to the levels of where we accept it in the academy and it has the ability to breathe. I think that's the way that you um, catalyze audiences. It has to be music of the common tongue. I mean, we're speaking a foreign language to people specifically the further we get away from immigrants and, and, and the music of, of America, early America, the young people now have no ties to that if they don't have it in their music. It's their grandmother, it's their great grandmother. So first, second generations, they still had that, they were tethered to that European canon. And the more we get, Albert Murray uses this word, omni-Americans, the more we become all Americans, it has to be the music of our culture. It has to be the zeitgeist. And you can't rain that down. Culture can't be rained down. It has to grow up from the soil. So it has to be early education. It has to be something that we validate. So they're coming in there listening to this. How do we, how do we give validation to something that they're listening to that's popular or not specifically classical? Because um, those are all constructs. I mean, you just look at all, look all of Picasso. I mean, that's all folk. So I, I'm thinking specifically about the question. I think I think it was maybe just posed. Just you know, um, why don't why haven't we given um, due respect to songs from enslaved peoples from the Negro spirituals? Why haven't we given due respect to jazz? And I think we can all agree the answer is racism. So uh, so yes, it was already pointed to us that um, that these musics came from American soil. And there was a concerted decision made to not acknowledge them and to not allow them to ascend into these spaces. And so that when we when we do things like just call the things the things, it really does help us to move forward and say, OK, well, if that was a decision that was rooted in racism. How can we make an anti-racist decision? What might what does that look like? How can we be active in naming the ways we make decisions now? Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention is the resource of animating democracies, aesthetic perspectives which is a set of principles and attributes to think about excellence in arts, specifically for social change. But um, they have things like attributes like stickiness. So, you know, this idea when a piece of music or a, or a painting kind of sticks to you and days later, you still feel the impression of it upon your, even sometimes your skin, the openness of, this, of the piece, the resourcefulness of the artist, um, the disruption that it creates and causes. I constantly think about aesthetic perspectives and I would, um, I'm sure we'll drop the link in the chat soon, but um, as this idea, this awakening to think about the ways that art is subjective. When we say this is excellent, um, oftentimes we are bringing a subjectivity to it. And we saw this in here in Maryland with the Maryland State Arts Council making a determinate decision to say, we have long valued excellence in art as being art that is adjacent to Western classical tradition. All of our rubrics point towards that. All of our understandings point towards that. And we are making an explicit anti-racist decision to elevate the way that we understand art from the community, to involve the community themselves in explaining the art that is meaningful to them and setting out that standard of excellence. When we see those things start to trickle, we start to see kindergarten students show up and not be told that they're empty, but that they're full of musical information and stories and exciting things to share. We see classical musicians at the high school level understanding that the technical prowess that they need to ascend, yes, but they also keep in touch with their ability to share musical stories that stem from their own life experience. And hopefully in the future, we will hear things on the concert stage that are divergent, that are different. Um, and that may, that may leave tradition behind, yes, but that also are exciting and vibrant and full of vitality from lots of different voices. And I think we can all agree that there's some stagnation happening around the innovative voice. It's been a while since I showed up and heard something that I've never heard before. <laughs> a musical texture that is 
arresting. Yes. The last time I remember it, I was in middle school and it was Mary J. Blige. That's the last time I remember being like, what is this? <laughs> yes. But I haven't heard a musical texture since then. That was arresting. And, and, and if you all have, please drop it in the chat. So that's what we want to get to. And I think that's the collective bargaining that diversity has to offer is not is beyond just the, the audience or the financial payout that may occur. But this idea of innovation, of driving the art form forward, of seeing what happens when we allow ourselves to, to throw away some of the things that keep us from seeing the beauty around us right, the creators around us, and we invite everyone to participate in the humanistic, humanistic um, trait of making music together and being a creator. Fredera, please. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of quick things, um, and this conversation is so important. But Fred, going back to your question about is access enough, and I would say it's not. Um, because what are we giving access to? And I'm going to couple that with another thing that I hear often. People say things like with classical music outreach, community outreach, oh, we're taking music to XYZ, poor black or brown community. And my response is, I promise you they already have music. I promise you they do. I promise you're not going to roll up in that neighborhood and it's going to be dead silence. So that's not what's happening. That's number one. And there's likely already some presence of classical music also in that community. So are we taking the time to figure out what that presence is and how to tap into that? That's that's one thing. But there is an existential question for the classical arts. And it is, is it, and I saw in the chat somebody mentioning highbrow and lowbrow. And then Pierre Bordeaux's, uh, the, social, uh, the French sociologist in his book, Distinction, he talks about how classical music and the visual arts are used in society to protect social capital and one's elite position in a society. That is how classical music is designed to function in the United States, still in a lot of ways. And so the fundamental question is, do we want to keep that um, role and function? Or do we see classical music as a realm in which People can bring the entirety of themselves and their musical experiences to engage and experience classical music. I love everything Darren was saying about ritual. I think that's so important. And it, I just want to drop the name of Samuel um, A. Floyd Jr., who wrote the book, The Power of Black Music, the brilliant musicologist who talks so um, poignantly about these things. And so, you know, it's great to have... Um, um, pipeline programs, um, um, you know, early childhood education programs and do and community outreach and all of that. But if fundamentally what we're asking people to do is leave the majority of themselves and their experience and their expression at the door in order to engage, then we aren't doing what we think we're doing. We're being assimilationist and we're reaffirming these hierarchies and ways of being that um, ignore the vibrancy that the music can continue to be infused with, both in terms of composition and creation, as Alicia was just saying, but also in terms of how the experience is imagined in and of itself. Um, uh, I was going to ask your question. First of all, Fedora, I think you just said the room on fire. That's one of the fundamental problems that we are always asked to check our personality at the door before we enter the classical stage. Fred, to your question, uh, I'm going to go back to my statement of honesty. I think like the FDA, we need to revamp the curriculum and the way we see institutions. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. In order to get something new, you have to do something you've never done before. And to the credit of resources, if someone calls you basic, that's not a compliment. We're checking the box and we're doing the very basic of providing resources. If you <clears throat> want someone to compete on an audition level and someone's or uh, if it was a race car driving a Formula One and you give them the best Toyota Camry known to man, good luck with that. You know, so it's not just exposure to music, but it's piano lessons, it's musical theory. And from an administration point of view, it seems funny, but it's not. You should be concerned that you don't have a harmonica studio. You should be concerned that rap is not being taught because that's how we get ahead. We're, we're looking at things that don't exist, that need to exist, that's going to change our society and the social consciousness of our entire environment. 
And I think that's really what needs to happen is that we need we need unlimited resources so that people of color or underrepresented groups can compete at the highest level. And you might ask yourself, so what does that look like? It's simple. What's happening on one side should be happening on the other. If it's not, we need to figure it out. And oftentimes, I think there's a handicap that's given and we are checking the basic box and saying, look at us, look what we did. And we're expecting praise. But I'm of the mindset that you don't praise a fish for swimming. You have to take extraordinary measures and do extraordinary things so we can reach extraordinary heights. Thank you. We are teaching rap here, but we don't have the harmonic studio yet. And I, I, that wasn't directed at you. I was no, just no, 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 an analogy because, you know, I'm, but this is the kind of creativity no, we need, you know, and, and I think until we get around the table and talk about it, we're going to be in trouble. And I can't for the life of me figure out why no one has scheduled a world music summit. We have a tuba summit. We have a ethnocology summit. But how about a world music summit? Something that's never been done. And let's talk about it in Europe. Let's talk about it in America. And let's see what our collective minds come up with. But I mean, this, this, is, this is where I do, you know, this is why I asked the question in the beginning. Because, because you know, when I think about here in Baltimore, if somebody is applying to the Peabody Institute, they're not going to get into the Peabody Institute if they can't read music. Now, I can go to probably any number of churches around this city and find remarkably talented kids that have improvis improvisational skills that have a you know, and they may or may not have learned to read music. But that that automatically would exclude them from today, you know, from from getting into a school like this. And that's why I partly asked that question, you know, yeah. when, when, when how we measure and how we assess even, I think is arguably problematic. I'm going to say this, you know, about I think what Darren was saying, the problem is honesty sometimes hurts. And I think the rubric of the measure and the item in which we measure is faulty. It's outdated. Yeah. So when you tell me that it's a requirement that you can have, that you must read common music notation, we're limited. <laughs> right. And we have to come to grips with that somehow. That's right. Sorry, and and I'm just going to chime in. I think this this is this is the critical point, right? This is the tipping point, as to reference Mal Malcolm Gladwell, right? We have this opportunity to say, you know what, the, these uh, this rubric that we're using is not conducive to the talent, to the representation that we want to see. We're going to change that. It is the curriculum, right? It's the curriculum redesign, and I just want to say something, perhaps that might be quite. <laughs> understated, but simply put, there won't be an audience problem if the art is reflective of the people that are in the community. There just won't be. And I think when when institutions actually accept that, really build that in deep and understand what that means, we're not going to have an audience problem. We're not going to have generations to come problem. It, it's not going to be an issue. And when we move past, you know, the word um, conserve, conservatorship, um, has been thrown around a lot, but I think to to Alicia's point earlier, we can conserve, but when institutions also move from the mindset of conservation to creation, when that is the tipping point and that is a thought leader for the institutions, again, we will not run into these challenges because we will force ourselves to be malleable and to see outwardly and not just be focused on protecting what we call ourselves in our identity, right? So I think, again, we ask these questions, we have these conversations, and I just, I, I empower, I'll use that word, <laughs> but I empower leaders to, to take that on and say, now is my moment to hit reset, to pause and say, this can change. I do want that talent. I do want a revised curriculum. I do want something different on my stage. Let's do that. Do you, um, Carl, did you want to say something? You look like you did. I do. I really, really do. <laughs> I wanted to say something each time. Um, I, so back back to your idea about um, you looking at the demographic changes and how we won't have an audience. I just want to pause and acknowledge the structure of that and that these institutions were built. And this was always the demographic trend and they have 
continued with this demographic trend and we have not yet seen substantive changes. So first we've got to just acknowledge then what is the ideology behind them? What was the purpose for them? And what is the mythology governing them? And I think without first delving into that, we would still be on shifting sand if we're making changes, but not acknowledging how these institutions have survived. And when I think about conservatories, there, there, is, a, there is a school of music that takes their first year graduate vocal majors all to Italy. That is very expensive. And that is a massive investment in this tradition that we're upholding. So I also want to acknowledge that we are still investing actively in this tradition to the tunes of millions and billions of dollars. And as we knew this conversation would also have to veer to, can we make a similar or an equitable investment in these ideas that we're talking about? I did a presentation in Stockholm on gospel music in Scandinavia. And it kind of opened my eyes because I grew up, well, actually it, my presentation started as rap music in Scandinavia, but then I, it moved to gospel. I grew up with gospel music. It was every day, it was everywhere. People asked me when I started to sing and I'm like, huh? Like there, <laughs> there was no start. It's what I did in the belly. It's what I did once I got out. Um, and I never thought of it as this cultural heirloom till I moved to Europe and realized that it was so popular and so hungered after and so therapeutic to all of these people that did not share the same cultural boundaries. And then I found out that in Sweden, there's this, they encourage kids to take a gap year. And you can, in that gap year, go and travel the world, but you could also go to a gospel music school for two years. And to that idea of literacy being a requirement to study music in the realm of like studying note notation, well, that wouldn't be a barrier here. So there are models that already exist. And what I try to do with my work is to recognize the research that has been done and those shovel ready projects that are ready for implementation because we realize there's so many things that need to be done, but we can put boots on the ground. We can establish some sort of certificate or institute where we can acknowledge the full musics that are happening in our cities, the full classical musics, the full contemporary musics. And we don't even have to bring people in. We can go to those people and we can get involved in a participative way that is more responsive to the music and more reflective of what music has been and is and the, the full value of what people bring. So this conversation could go on, I'm sure, for another two hours. It's amazing, actually. It's really, really amazing. Um, but I think we promised we would take some questions from our listeners. So we're gonna, we're gonna honor that promise and we're gonna do that. Um, and through that, continue the conversation. So first question, how can arts education organizations serving a predominantly white community, both geographically within the student body, diversify their repertoire without appropriating other cultures? One context. Second. It's all it's it's gonna be about context. We do it all the time with our, our history classes and everything. We put all of what we do into context. And I think appropriation is an issue when things are taken out of context and not consulted and not researched as thoroughly as we do with other musics. And I would only add to that collaboration. You know, you bring in specialists right? You bring in community and cultural practitioners, you partner with them um, to add and make sure that that context is as robust and accurate as it needs to be. Um, and you pay them equitably for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other comments, Ramas? Okay. Uh, Another question, Lauren. How can educators best welcome their students' past personal experiences into the classroom to honor the education they have received their whole lives? So it goes back to something I think we were obviously talking about earlier. So we'd like to respond to that. 
I'm, I'm yeah. not, um, you know, I think it it's a matter of, first of all, as an educator, always being curious and bringing that curiosity and bringing that open space of co-leadership, co-collaborativeness in the classroom, understanding that you as the as the teacher, as the educator, are not the holder and the entirety of the knowledge that is being shared in the room. So how are you creating lesson plans or structures, almost like, you know, you have a, a baby or toddler, I have a toddler, so now my mind is in that mindset. <laughs> but, you know, how are you building the parameters for safe exploration, for safe um, expression, to honor that expression, and then to bring that back into what is being taught? and to value that. So once that experience is shared, once those ideas are shared, you as the educator, as the more um, uh, person who's lived on this earth a little bit longer, right? Just a little bit longer than those in your classroom. How are you weaving that into the reflection of the study and what you're doing as a group? So I think it's 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 understanding your role in in helping to shepherd a little bit rather than direct and give and pour into. It is a, a free flowing symbiotic <laughs> relationship that is happening. I think when, when we as educators understand that, when we embrace and invite our students to, to activate the leadership in themselves, right? And to share comfortably with others in their learning space, I think that will be your igniter for best representing your students, their personal experiences, their what they view as valuable in the world. I I um I love I love what Camille said and, and I want to acknowledge too how hard that is for us as musicians to say we are not the experts in the room because we that's what we've been conditioned to share. Um, right. Um, but that breakdown of um, and that unlearning is a, is a fundamental part of being a 21st century educator. When I was at the State Department, when I would go around and talk to theater educators <clears throat> and dance educators about centering their students' personal experiences in the classroom as a fundamental way to be in alignment with the National Core Art Standards, they were like, great. Uh, we could we let the students choreograph phrases all the time um, in response to prompts and questions. We devise theater here. We do that all the time. Visual art teachers sometimes needed a little tweak. So we shouldn't see a, a wall full of same paintings, right? We should see some differences. They need a little tweak. The music teachers would hold on to their instruments and say, absolutely not. This is, we're not doing that. <laughs> we, we have, sometimes they would say things like, we have technique to teach. I'm like, don't say that in front of a dancer, P.S. Yes. Um, uh, uh, they really clung to this idea of I am conductor or I am the, the fount of knowledge and there isn't room for my students' experiences. The students aren't capable. They don't know enough. I'm starting from scratch. They don't have any material to share musically, right? So there's a whole shift in learning that has to happen. I'm happy to say the national place our national court standards support a shift in pedagogy. So we can all breathe a sigh of relief that we have national policy that supports that shift. And it's now time for states and local school systems to push those things into action that the national um, <laughs> policies already created where we are allowing students to compose music in music classrooms. Students should be composing and sharing just like they do in all their other art form classes. They should be sharing their ideas and thoughts and priorities musically like they do in dance. They do the same thing, but with kinesthetic knowledge. They do it in visual art, but with visual information. And in music class, that has to be a priority. At Sister Cities Girl Choir, we have an art strategy goal that by 2024, half of our repertoire will be original works from our students. We've already met that goal. We set the goal in 2018. We've already, we've already surpassed it. We have students, families, teachers composing and creating. We've never been happier with all of the musical learning that's happening, right? But there was a lot of shifting for us as conservatory trained musicians and music educators to say, I'm not responsible for filling the room with all of my knowledge, okay? I got to talk to somebody about that. I might have to do a few few therapy sessions. I might have to take a few courses and fill in some gaps. There's some healing. I need some feedback. I might have to build some community of other educators that can help me and give some feedback to how my instruction is shaping up, right? There's some work that has to be done to do it because we've never seen it before. 
We weren't Richard, taught that way. Richard, did you want to say something too? Yeah, I think as educators, to answer this question, we have a responsibility to meet each student where they're at not where we think they should be at. And I think we each have to find something that we absolutely love about each student because it's gonna allow us to go past the point of exhaustion because you're gonna hit that wall. And I think the thing that every institution that helped me become the person I am today is that no one ever gave up on me. And I think that's why you have to find something that you absolutely love about each student. <clears throat> And then we have to understand that just like in music, different styles, we may wear various roles. Uh, this is a big hint for everyone to pick up my third book when it comes out. The styles of teaching I have in there is the motivator, the truth teller, the dreamer, the freestyler, the storyteller. And we're going to have to be all of these styles of teaching at one point or another to relate to the student that we're coming in, but that are coming into our classrooms and environment. But most importantly, we have to learn to meet each student where they're at and grow from there. And we must always remember that great people aren't born great they grow great. And that's our primary responsibility is to help these students to grow great. One of the things also, I, uh, you know, this question reminds me of this idea that there are, there are bright spots, I think, you know, in, in the classical arts world where, particularly I think of contemporary composition, and I think of how that's changed in the last 20 or 30 years from a much more, um, prescribed, stylistically prescribed what was acceptable to, I think, a much broader range of where composers individually are bringing in their backgrounds and their own their own experiences and their histories and, and everything that they brought with them long before they started to study music in, it, to actually shape their own, you know, personal voice compositionally. And I think there's, you know, in, in a sense, I think there's really hope for barriers breaking down through that kind of activity. And I think of this, and I think that that's, that's what they're trying to do actually here. Um, Lauren, do we have another question? How do we recognize the history of HBCUs that have been performing works by artists of color and create conversations with institutions that have already established these practices? I'm gonna look to you, Fredera, for this, like right away you're smiling and I know you've got a lot to say about it. I have nothing to say. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, through, I'll go back to something I said earlier that really governs um, everything I do involving HBCUs, and that is um, equitable collaboration. Um, and I think it starts with, uh, and this carries over into the work I do with the Denise Grace Foundation and Shared Voices. Um, one, just really understanding, acknowledging, and respecting um, the tremendous contributions HBCUs have made to American music musically. Like that's just a fundamental thing. We could talk about the Fish Jubilee singers. We wouldn't. We likely would not have a canon of Negro spirituals to sing if the Fish Jubilee singers in 1871 had not started. That's a great example of people taking the music of their own community and uh, uh, arranging it and preserving it in a classical form um, for their own good in some ways, their own benefit in some ways, because the money that the Fisk Jubilee Singers raised went to help to keep Fisk Institute then open, right? And gave them a chance to have, um, a greater chance to have an, an education. But um, more broadly speaking, uh, one, just awareness and understanding of what these institutions for the, since the, the, since the period of reconstruction, um, and before you have a few HBCUs founded before, but from the 19th century to this day have con continued to contribute both in classical music, but even in addition to that, um, in so many other ways that in one of the things I talk about in my book is how HBCUs have a presence in just about every musical genre you can think of in this country. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, especially pre-desegregation, the best black musicians in this country could teach nowhere else but at historically black colleges. And so the richness of those programs um, was really incredible and still remains so in lots of ways. And so I think 
um, partnering, meeting and learning um, faculty at these institutions um, and, 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 and learning from them and asking them uh, what is beneficial to them from collaboration? What might they get out of, um, you know, uh, partnering with other institutions and all of that, um, I think is the right way um, ethically to um, engage that rich history. I remember just last October, we did a whole symposium, um, the Society of Ethnomusicology did with um, the Atlanta University Center in, in Atlanta, which is the home of Morehouse College, um, Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, Morris Brown Interdenominational Theological Center, and Morehouse School of Medicine. And we were like, hey, we would really like to do this with you. Help us understand um, what might be useful and, and partnering with us to really excavate this history and bring this to folks who just don't know for any number of reasons, mostly racism. But um, And they had their own ideas. Their librarians had their own ideas. Their faculty had their own ideas. And we came away with something that gave um, our audience as a society of ethnomusicology a greater understanding, not just of the history, but of the bright um, presence of these institutions still. And I think this is incredibly important in a moment where you have young, talented, smart, young Black people who are deliberately choosing HBCUs even over conservatories because they are so um, seeking a, a reprieve from racism or a, an affirming educational experience, right? Or um, the, the beauty that comes with being both Black and anonymous on the HBCU campus. And so even when we're thinking about where do we find, you know, musicians and singers and all of that, um, it, it further emphasizes why HBCU should absolutely be a part of this, this conversation because students are choosing them. Um, also, again, just how we even talk about these histories in the absence of so many Black uh, classical musicians and singers being able to um, uh, join our orchestras and symphonies and opera companies. HBCUs were a sustaining force in their careers, being able to tour there, being able to lecture there, being able to visit there. So I love that word that Carl used earlier, ecosystem. And I actually use it in my book. I talk about HBCU music, musical ecosystems um, because it helps us to broaden our thinking about how we even, the truth of how classical music lives and breathes in the United States. Like it, it really pushes our thinking, uh, I think in profound ways when we listen to and learn from and don't just see HBCUs as a, as a target for charity um, or philanthropy and money is important, but we also see them as a source of knowledge, experience, information from which we need to listen and learn. I would like to add to that. That's brilliant. Yeah, that, great. Um, you know, it's important also, and we expand, a lot of times there's an intersectionality in terms of inside of HBCUs, there can also be classism, right? I went to an HBCU. I talked to Richard Smallwood about that. Richard Smallwood could not play gospel music at Howard University. So there's this whole idea of being inside of an HBCU or aligning yourself with performing artists of color, their works, and not just going in and picking and identifying with colors that validate the same experience that you might valid that that you might have inside of a white institution. That happens all the time, and the range of expressions inside of the African American tradition. I mean, I was talking to Terrence about his opera, and it's like, oh yeah, they ha of course they had to sing bel canto because any type of other utterances that come from African American culture or musical vocal traditions is something that's still frowned upon. So how do we make sure even side of HBCUs, there's the challenges of African-Americans going to HBCUs, wanting to perform hip hop, gospel, jazz. And it's like, oh, I was there. And my piano teacher was like, you better play your Schubert. You better play your Mozart. You leave gospel for church next, next week. So it's the, the idea of even inside these spaces where we exist of elevating um, these traditions. Because each, each of these traditions have their own value of excellence and quality. Like you can't go to church and, and each one of these traditions know when there's bad music, right? So we can't just say that there's not bad music because it's not classical music. Like every, every church 
every jazz club, every rapper has their own validation and quality assessment. Um, so I just said that to say it's important because we can go inside of HBUs and say, hey, we're going to grab Margaret Bond and Price and a little Hell Stork and a little Steel. But yet there's a whole treasure trove of artists and composers and experiences that can still, you know, be underserved and underrepresented. And, and if, I, if I may, I thank you all for speaking to the multiplicity of the experience at HBCUs and the, the historicity of them. Um, and this intersects also with my work because my dissertation was on pioneering African-American teachers of singing, most of whom got a lot of experience by teaching at HBCUs before they were allowed or summoned or called to the historic, to the predominantly white institutions where a lot of their careers were made. And we are at a critical time right now where a lot of the history of those moments is being lost by virtue of these people passing away because the 1960s and 70s were such a momentous time on these campuses. And so I think another way that we can recognize this history is by providing the resources to go out and capture those stories. And when I tell you, these stories are vibrant. So I did not attend an HBCU, but I, I feel like I did because in high school, I was very involved with the program at Bethune-Cookman University, where I played for all of the opera workshop. My mother went to Bethune-Cookman, my father went to FAM. That's a whole nother story. But the thing is, I grew up around these members of the, the Thomas Stemps Chorale telling stories about their tours throughout the world in Israel and in Europe and throughout the United States. These are such vibrant, rich stories. We need resources, we need to record them and we need to document them. Because as we realize, especially this intersects with um, kind of what I do with queer studies, the, it, the, the archive doesn't always recognize or doesn't have the logic to recognize how to preserve our stories accurately. And so we have to jump in and we have to really demand and insist that we create a space that can do that. Carl, we're probably cousins because you're from Florida. Yes, I'm from, well, okay, let's, let's chat offline. We're probably related. <laughs> I just and real quick, I want to go back to what Karen was saying to kind of close the loop on that about the rich, rich, rich diversity of music traditions that exist on historically black colleges that are not valued equally. They are not in terms of the institution itself. It's Tanahasi Coates, um, who brilliantly says in Between the World and Me, there is Howard University, an institute of higher, ed higher education and accreditation and degree granting and all of that. And then there is the yard, right? And those two, two related things where everybody hangs out and, and sort of the, the culture someone was talking about earlier from the ground up sort of emanates. Mm -hmm. But why that is so is because HBCUs were also following conservatory models or accreditation standards that demanded that even in a Black space, that Black students leave the music of their community outside the practice rooms outside the curriculum and so you know as these and even now part of the justification that some professors music professors at hbcus give is that they're preparing students to go to Juilliard, university of michigan peabody and right. so there is a broadening that can happen for all kinds of institutions as we continue to rethink um how a lot of the policies of classical arts work you're brilliant it's really helped really really fantastic um Another question, Lauren. What sorts of exposures or experiences would you like students to have in K through 12? Where can educations look for partnerships and resources to prepare educators? I would like look for partnerships and resources to prepare younger students. So that earlier tracking question again. And yeah, I'm happy to kick this off too. Um, it, it's interesting. I think we've spoken to a lot of it on during this call already. And, you know, I think particularly um, Alicia bringing up kind of the national standards and where we need to move, composing, experience, composing, creating, composing, creating, and making that a part of the culture inside the classroom are it surprisingly experiences that not a lot of our young artists, young musicians, young people 
are participating in, right? And there are other disciplines that, you know, in, in dance and visual art and, and various other things, attributes that lean more towards that way. We are not really doing that in music. We are re, we are recreating what's on the page. We are re, re-envisioning what's on the page. So I think that experience in general, I think the experience of young musicians having teaching teachers, educators, teaching artists, however you label yourself, that are from their community and look like them, this sounds very basic, it is still not the majority of what we are seeing, right? And we have people who are like, oh, I really need to learn, I really need to learn. Why don't we go into the community and just invite them in? And even if they don't have these traditional backgrounds, okay, are we making space for that? So I think that's a, a second vital point. Um, and so, you know, the need to look for partnerships and resources, there's a need to look at your business model. <laughs> there's a need to look at your program design and who you're hiring, where you're recruiting, and how the curriculum is built. So I think it's a little bit more internal work that has to be done before we talk about outside experiences and what's happening with just the basic framework. If we have to do all this patchwork, to make sure our young people have good experiences, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. And who's at the table helping you to make that decision? Any other responses to this? Um, yeah, I would say we have a, a tendency to make nouns out of verbs or to reify. So we the reification of the word music, where it becomes a noun, not something that you do, not an activity. And I think that is vital to young minds. Carl talked about coming out of the womb or in the womb or you dance, you know music. Music is an activity. It's a function of your life. It permeates every aspect of who you are. And we have a tendency to have the reification around music and dance where it becomes almost, what I call like the Medusa syndrome. It gets frozen or fixed and rigid. And when we take it out of that and take this reification of abstraction like of music and say it to music, to dance, to, it kind of gives a, a new um, way of experiencing things that we tend to freeze um, in the experience of, of um, and specifically in education, specifically like early, early education. I know my nieces and nephews, they just like to dance. They like to hear music. They like to, I mean, they're just engaged. It's, it's like walking, it's like talking. Um, so it's the idea of just allowing the music to, to happen as an activity and as a, as a point of engagement and as a point of human encounter, I mean, just a way up to affirm, you know, that's the most basic political act is a performance or a musical encounter because we know music and pol politics is about power and the power to define oneself um, in any way that you see fit to, to define that. Uh, specifically as a child, when everything is a tabula rasa, it's a, it's a white space before all of the constructs get piled on them. So I would say in education, just the activity and the and the space to engage and whether it's dance. I mean, we always see finger painting, you know, your refrigerator is, is full of, but somehow all of that gets into form and style and education and standardization. And we lose the, the, the flexibility of, of the way we should be engaging and the activities of art and not just the nouns and the, the abstractions of art. Um, so, so, um, Thanks, Darren. And I get we have a few minutes left, and I want to. I'd like to come back to um, a question we asked the panel this morning, which is um, because again, I'm thinking sort of we've got folks that are from different institutions out there listening to this, and people, you know, in terms of a takeaway, you know, from today, there are many takeaways, obviously. But um, what is, what is the one thing that you would say to an institution to um, or that you think every institution should do, should start doing, and the one thing they should stop doing to advance the issues that we've been talking about today. One thing to start doing and one thing they should stop doing. Anybody want to take a pass at that? I, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, one of them is, is just humanistic and it's not... Uh... It's not music related, but I think there are thousands of problems in the world and 99% of them can be solved if we were just kind. All institutions need to learn to be kind 
regardless of the ethnicity and background that's before them. I think we're not doing a very good job of that. And then the one thing I think they should stop doing is making decisions from the top. I think decisions should be made from the bottom up. Uh, I think they need to do those three things that we learn when crossing the street. Stop, look, and listen. And recognize that there's a difference between recogni recognition and acknowledgement. We recognize the students, but to acknowledge them would be to stop them and say, hi, how are you doing? What do you think? Those are two different things. Uh, that's my quick two cents on that. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else. Yeah, I would say uh, regionalism and being local has been great, has been grayed out by monoculture, mass culture, whether that's in commercialism, whether that's in the academy. So I would say start to look in your local community for other voices to contribute to self-expression in your spaces. Um, there's a brilliance in that. And like I said, stop looking to the monoculture. It's the collapse of information that's really grayed out the brilliance of localism. Um, that's something regionalism has been lost in America. Um, and I think that's something that we need to do more of. There was a time where if you lived in the South, it was different than the East and the West Coast had its own sound. Everybody has been kind of siloed into this one way of seeing, one way of hearing, one way of expressing. I think there's a lot of um, diversity in local, your local and your regional community and a lot of um, expression in that voice and the power of that voice. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I, I really love this question, Fred. And I think a couple things I would say, um, I'll start with stop, you know, for institutions, stop trying to fit round pegs into square holes. Okay. Tr build a new board. <laughs> build a new board because that that's where we are at this point. And, you know, I, it's very interesting for those that are familiar with uh, Khan Academy and, and the supports that it provides to people all over the world, the founder was talking about the concept of new math and how new math is created. And if a student comes to you and says, well, three plus three is seven. And you say, well, no, 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 that's six. You know, this is what you have to learn. But he said, stop for a minute and say to yourself, what would have to be true for three plus three to equal seven? That is how new math is created. That is how we're gonna build new boards. I'm so upset, Camille, because you keep stealing everything I want to say right out my mouth. Um, so I like I wholeheartedly agree. And in order to to do those things that my colleagues are talking about, um, at least from a legion perspective, I encourage people to our professors, faculty, to stop using the same syllabus. Throw out your syllabus. I don't care if it was great last year. 365 days have passed. We are at a different place in the universe or in the multiverse right now. And in order to really try to create these changes, like Camille was saying, we can't just like readjust. So I've got this square peg, this round hole. I'll just like carve one notch here. It, it won't work. Um, we've got to acknowledge the structural racism that has gone on in building these systems and even in our own systems of knowledge and thinking and be prepared to wash it away and start again each year just like we do with other processes just like we do with the budget we we start over again and we gotta follow those dollars and then what we should what i would like to see us do more is indulge in imagination because we have not even begun to tell the tale yet. So I think that there's more possibility there. That's great. I would just add, and that's that whole round peg square hole thing is just sitting with me because that's really the crux of so much of this. Um, I would say we've got to, if we are serious, I always preface things well, if we are serious, if we are serious, then we've got to stop worshiping and deifying history and yesterday. And we've got to be more concerned with the here and now. We have to be. It doesn't mean a complete rejection of history. I love history and it's in tradition and canon, but we have to be more concerned, right? With what's happening with people now, the people who are here with us in this brief moment of life now 
And what we should start doing is open our doors. And I mean that in at every level in every way so that we can go out <laughs> into the world and, and be, be a greater part of the world um, and that people can come in and bring themselves into the space, right? Like both of those things can happen. In my um, African-American music class, it's the grad course. And it sounds so simple, but I found find this to be one of the most effective things. Two of their assignments over the course of the semester, go out and hear some black music somewhere, somehow in New York City. I, t you know, they run it by me. Well, I think I'm going to hear this. I'm going to see this, whatever. But, you know, one of the greatest attributes of Juilliard is that it's in New York City, right? Like, I'm like, whatever music we talk about, we can find it somewhere in this town, right? And so literally just go out and hear it in its own context, you know, wherever that is, however that is. And students always come back and just like, one, I, it forces them to look and see what's available beyond, you know, the, the performances that they would normally go, go see, you know, the Med or the New York Phil or whomever. But making it experiential in that way um, has a profound effect on them. And so finding however many ways to do that um, so that, you know, when they come out of our institutions and they're building professional careers, these things aren't affectations for them. They aren't something they have to figure out how to do. But we should see it as an essential part of the education that they receive, that they are comfortable and culturally competent engaging people from backgrounds that are different from theirs, musics that are different from theirs, right? They know for themselves how to start building those bridges for, for, for themselves. So I think, you know, stop deifying history and, and treating it in, as it is this perfect um, thing that is untouchable um, and really being uh, uh, thoughtful and passionate about the folks that we are sharing Spaceship Earth with right now. So that that is going to be that's great, Fidera, and that's going to be the final word, um, which is a great place to end. We are, believe it or not, at the end of our time. We're right on um, time. It's fantastic. We're right on time. I, you know, I want to thank uh, first of all, Alicia. Thank you for being such a, a great a great thank partner. Thank you, Fred. Really, really, um, just a joy to work with you on this whole project, and um, and to all of you, our panelists, um, Darren, Camille. Richard, Federa, and Carl, what, what a great conversation. Really rich and, and varied and just uh, so interesting. And I don't know, it's given me so much to think about. So um, it is, it's really, it's as the morning did also. So it's been a, it's been a great day. And uh, I'm just so appreciative of your being here and all the folks that have tuned in to, to listen and participate also. And um, so more to come on all of this, of course, as we look to the future. Thank you all. <laughs>